Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1989 film Sleepaway Camp 2 Unhappy Campers. And this is kind of the further evolution of the uh, psychosis of Angela Baker. Um, it, to be honest, I mean, this film, obviously, most people are not going to like it as much as the first one. I don't think I like it as much as the first one. But there are things to really like. And in many ways, it feels like this was kind of the logical move for doing a sequel to Sleepaway Camp. So anyway, I'll get more into that type of stuff. But first, I need to say, I watched this on the Shutter streaming service. They have all three of the Sleepaway Camp films on there at the moment when I'm doing this review. And I would recommend watching them. I'm going to do reviews for all of them. I already have a review up for the first Sleep Sleepaway Camp. I'm doing this one now. And then I will have Sleepaway Camp 3 Teenage Wasteland. That's what it's called. I'll be doing that one. So this one's directed by Michael A. Simpson, uh, who did films Impure Thoughts, Funland, and Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland. Uh, it was written by Fritz Gordon, who also wrote Sleepaway Camp 3, so we have that to look forward to. Um, and this was after, um, if you want more information on kind of like the franchise in general and all the films in the series, I talk about that in the first review for regular Sleepaway Camp, so go back and check that out, because I'm not going to rehash all of it. It's definitely worth listening to. So this was kind of after it had been sold off by Hits uh, Hiltzik, who was the originator of the first Sleepaway Camp, so then trying to cash in on this. Uh, Angela in this one is not played by Felissa Rose. From what I've read online, it was kind of a situation where Felissa Rose, they actually, oddly enough, didn't really feel like she brought her A-game and she was really right for that role at the time, uh, but also uh, there was a component of she was um, really getting ready to go to college, so I, they're, they're kind of theorizing that the reason that she didn't have the chops that they were looking for, she wasn't all that interested at that point because she was looking to do other things in her life, mainly going off to college, so... Um, and But obviously, she ends up coming back much later, not in the third one, but the other ones that are hard to get a hold of. So Angela in this one is played by Pamela Springsteen. Yes, relation to Bruce Springsteen. It's actually her his, uh, sister, so that's kind of cool. I mean, she's obviously more famous than he is, at least for us horror folks. Uh, I don't listen to any Bruce Springsteen, actually. I mean, the guy's talented, no doubt, but like... I don't listen to him. So for me, the more popular Springsteen is Pamela Springsteen, which not many people probably say. But she was also in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which I love. And then she comes back to reprise her role as Angela in uh, Sleepaway Camp 3. So I'll be talking about that when I do that review. Now, the budget for this one is actually $100,000 higher than the first Sleepaway Camp, which is kind of weird because in certain ways it doesn't feel like there's more money in it. In certain ways it feels like there's potentially less money in it because the practical effects are not as good and they don't show as much I feel like there's there's some moments where there's some good practical effects but a lot there isn't because by and large they cut away from the kills quite a bit which you know they cut away to a degree in the in the original film but they always were showing uh, a good amount of time of the aftermath of what happened in the first one and they do that a little bit in this one but not nearly as much so it's kind of mind-blowing that it's $100,000 more budget on this one, and it's kind of less done in certain ways. But you also have to realize that this was done six years after that, so adjusting for inflation, blah, blah, blah. But it was still more money, so I feel like there should have been more done. Anyway, uh, so the shooting, they actually shot in Waco, Georgia at a YMCA youth camp. So different location, but they're saying, even though it's in Georgia, they're calling it New York, and they're saying it's not far from where Camp Arawak was in the story. Um, I like how, like, immediately in this film, they kind of address the events of the first film. But they do it in, this, in, in a very authentic way to integrate into the story, which is, you know, sitting around the campfire talking about uh, Angela Baker as not naming her, but talking about Angela as kind of like an urban legend at this point. And that's something that happens at, at camps. Well, I don't know if it does anymore, but did when I went to camp back in the day. Um, that was something, there was always these urban legends. And a lot of the times they were um, rooted in something that actually happened, but then things just get 
you know, exaggerated. But obviously in this film, those things are not exaggerated. Those things actually happen. But a lot of people probably within the story think that it's exaggerated until they find out the hard way it's not because Angela is there and she's killing people. So that's a good way to start things, but it's also a good way to kind of get people back up to speed to give a refresher because it had been six years since the last film. So it's good for a refresher, but also good for anyone who just happened to start watching the film and hasn't seen the first one. So it kind of lays all the ground, uh, the groundwork for what you needed to know. This sequel basically turns Angela into Jason Voorhees, to be honest, going around and dispatching bad campers. She even actually says to Uncle John, the head of the camp, that she's going to get rid of the bad campers. So, you know, that's just another one of those those moments of, like, veiled comments about killing campers, which there are a lot of them in this. Sometimes Angela does them, sometimes other people do them. And I think those are nice, funny moments that they kind of add in there, like the ironic comments that obviously the, the characters don't get it other than Angela, but the audience members get it. So you get, you know, a nice little chuckle out of it. Uh, but yeah, so she's basically turned into Jason Voorhees at this point. Um, but it's, you know, what are you going to do basically? And, and that's what I kind of wrote down is like most slasher sequels. This is the only real logical move at this point after the mystery of the first film is basically over. It just becomes turning to, uh, fun kills and just guessing who's going to get it next. Now that said, I think that they kind of missed the mark a little bit on this because, Sure, it's all about the kills. Sure, it's all about who's going to get it next. And you pretty much know who until the end when things just unravel totally with Angela. Not like she wasn't already unraveling, but or totally unraveled. But, um, yeah, it just kind of, um, it, they fall short on it because since it's the sequel and you don't have anything that people are trying to guess, you know who the killer is, obviously, you need more interest. And more interest would come mainly with better kills. And I would argue that they're not better kills for the most part in this, except the outhouse toilet one is is pretty awesome and gross and funny. Um, but other than that, they're not that great at kills. And I think they're overall not better than the first sleepaway camp. The other thing is you need to up the gore factor. You need to up the practical effects. You need to show the kills. And they don't do that. So they're not delivering. You need to go bigger. You need to go better. And they just don't do it with that. What they do deliver on to try and make up for that is a lot more nudity, a lot more sexual content. Now, for someone like me, like, I don't really care. You know, I'm almost 40 years old at this point. Um, I don't really care about seeing nudity and sex in film. To be honest, I'm kind of over it at this point in my life. Uh, give me the gore. Give me the practical effects. That's what I want to see. That's the fun stuff. So I think they kind of screwed up in a few ways with this but that said I still enjoy the film and there are a lot of things to like about it e even like the overall story works it definitely works I'll talk a little bit more about that there's no way that the shit sisters wouldn't end up hearing Angela walk up to them when they get when they're about to get killed when they're making out with guys the ones making out with the guy the other one's just being high um, and barely coherent um, she walks up in the woods and there's no way they wouldn't hear. She's like right next to them and they're still unaware that she's there. And there's a lot of that in this film where like she's right there and people would definitely know that she's there. But, you know, then again, it's 80s horror and that's kind of what they did. People were uh, unbelievably oblivious uh, and it's like they almost didn't have any senses. Uh, definitely no sensibility. <laughs> uh, the funny thing about this is they were burnouts. So guess what? They got burned, how she sets them on fire. Now, they should have shown that type of thing. Obviously, they didn't need to actually do any stunts where they set someone on fire. They could just set a dummy on fire or something or show it from far enough away that you can't make out what it actually is. Um, yeah, just another one of those missed opportunities. It doesn't really make sense when Angela says she's sending campers home because she's making herself a prime suspect for when they're found dead, if they're found dead. And even if they're not found dead... The fact that people will know that they're missing at some point, she has told people that she was the last person to see them. She sent them home. So it doesn't really jive. It doesn't really make sense because she's usually very smart about her killing um, until the very end, obviously. But that just seems like a plot hole to me that she would just be telling, oh, well, I sent them home. I sent them home. It would make more sense if she's like, I don't know. They went off. They, they went missing or, you know, they ran away or something like that instead of. I sent them home, and I was the last person to see them. You know, it's just weird. 
Ah, the good old panty raid <laughs> that was talked about in many films back in this time, but I don't think it was it, it ever happened. The other thing is, even though it was talked about in films a lot back in, in this time period, I don't think it was ever shown. So the fact that they actually put a panty raid on screen is kind of funny, kind of weird. Um, yeah, I was. it just occurred to me while I was watching. I was just like, you know, I talked about panty raids a lot. I don't think that was ever a real thing. It was just something that film created. And then Sleepaway Camp 2 actually put it on the screen, which I don't think anyone else really did that. But I'm probably wrong. You can put a comment down there. Uh, Mary says she'd rather die than apologize. Okay. Be careful what you ask for because that's exactly what happens. So this was another one of those prime moments with the drill killing that they should have been showing that. That's a prime good kill right there. Yes, they show her, you know, like put, putting it in the direction of Mary and the blood flying on her, but that's not enough. Not in a sequel. It's not enough. Ugh. The intentionally comedic moments actually work for the most part in this. That's what I was kind of talking about with those kind of veiled comments in the dialogue about like campers getting killed or offed or sent away, stuff like that. Uh, the nods to Freddy, Jason, and Leatherface in this are fun moments. They're kind of funny. It's kind of like a, haha, we're very self-aware as a slasher film. We're going to make fun of ourselves a little bit. I like that. That, that was a nice moment. What a terrible, clumsy sex scene in the bathroom. Uh, that bathroom one it, where they're, like, getting it on, uh, they start by just showing, like, their calves down to their feet on the floor of the bathroom just like too long of a scene too clumsy and fumbling and just you know when you're giving us extra sex scenes like the sex scenes are bad in this too that's the other thing like i understand just showing more nudity because that's what they did back then that's something people really looked for in horror films back then so okay i get it but the sex scenes were so terribly acted and choreographed that they actually detracted from the sexiness aspect of it so just i mean they should have just shown more nudity and not had all the sex scenes or if you're going to show the sex scene just real quick you're done i like how ally asks if the guy she just boned has aids when they're done and i think this is kind of just <laughs> ridiculous it's just supposed to make her look even worse of a person and even more reckless and it this kind of falls into something i'm going to talk about later with the whole like slut shaming thing that was a big thing back then and just overall just like te if you're having sex you're a terrible person sex is so taboo society can't handle this if kids are having sex they're teenagers they're at camp you know it happens the best part of the film is when Allie gets shoved in the outhouse hole yes like I said before that is the best kill uh, and that is actually one where the way they did it totally fine it doesn't need to be super graphic and uh it's gross enough with how they hinted at things and then how they put like the fake leeches on and like the fake poop and everything like that like it's done well enough that they didn't have to go crazy high budget for that particular kill and it's effective so we just needed more of those types of kills we just didn't get them but that one is i mean that's probably my favorite part of the film to be honest Angela has a motive to go after bad campers, but she ends up making up a reason when she realizes she's almost going to get caught. That The first girl in particular where she says, you talk too much. And she has a, a very strict code of ethics with her killing up until that point. It's only people who are being bad. Then this girl's not being bad at all, so she finds something in her head while she's looking for something to kill her with. She comes up with something to kind of um, justify it to herself of, oh, well, she talks too much and that's a bad thing anyway. So then she kills her. And that kind of actually is the turning point where it kicks her into this tailspin where she then is kind of just like, um, it's kind of like she, she at that point just, uh, gives into the fact that she just likes killing. Prior to that, it seems like it's a necessity that she has to teach these people a lesson. She has to make them good again by killing them and cleansing them of their bad deeds um, and to her, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a more morality thing. It's a code of ethics. But then once she kills that person who she basically made up a reason for, it's like everything's out the window at that point. And she kind of admits to herself internally that, oh, well, I just like killing. So at this point, I already dispatched this person. Let's just kill more people. Let's, let's just satisfy the urges. And that's what happens. You know, she goes and she just kills people for no reason. 
throughout the rest of the film. The Happy Camper Song montage is pretty awful in this, and it's unbelievably drawn out. Uh, at this point, you're actually not showing the audience anything new or anything useful. It's poorly done, and they should have just not had that in the film at all. I mean, I guess it's supposed to show that she's, like, further losing it, but you could have done that with a much shorter scene. Or you didn't even need to do that, because we were already seeing that by who she killed. So, totally ineffective, pointless, and annoying. They should have taken that out. I do like the touch of Angela keeping all the bodies in the condemned cabin, and you kind of get the idea that she was hiding out at that cabin and living in that condemned cabin before the camp started, and that she probably just like walked out of the woods, found Uncle John, and was like, hey, I'm a local, I showed up, um, do you need a counselor? Because she, it seems she was already living there, because she had all the canned food there, and there was running water, all that stuff, so... Um, I thought that was kind of an, an interesting aspect to the story. And that's where I was saying earlier, like, there's good stuff about the story. Overall, it's a good story, and it works as the sequel, you know, for what you could really do for a sequel, to be honest. It's just that they missed the mark a lot with some of the other things they did. It's like she views people as cleansed and no longer bad if she's killed them. You kind of see that with the way she interacts with the dead bodies in that condemned cabin. She starts treating them as friends at that point. Um, bad campers are bad campers and she wants nothing to do with them except kill them. And then once that happens, it's like they're friends. And you you also see in her mind that she... Like, she feels like they're still alive at that point. And to her, they're actually potentially even more alive at that point because prior to that, she kind of views them as dead people walking anyway because she's like, bad person, I'm going to kill them. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting touch as well. Um, I think that they should have ended it when Angela killed everyone in the cabin and then she closes the dark cabin. And um, it's, it's the one where Uncle John was and the guy ha hanging... By his neck in this in the uh, corner uh i think when she's leaving she says something like sleep tight campers or something like that and then it's dark they should have just ended it there because i think after that it just gets too drawn out it doesn't have the impact that i think they were going for uh, it would have been a much better ending when she just leaves that cabin and it's dark that's what i was looking for plus it obviously sets you up for another one which you know they do that at the end but i just think it would have been better earlier ended so some overall thoughts at the end about this. Uh, what sucks about this film is that they keep cutting away from the actual kills. This happened in the first one, but those kills were more interesting, and you saw the aftermath quite a bit more. For a sequel, you need to up the ante, and this, this actually takes a step back from the original film in that way. Um, you're not going to be able to have as much story like we talked about already, and you need to recognize that. Uh, what little bit of story they have, like I was saying, it's good, it does work for being the sequel, but they just needed those better kills, those more interesting kills, the unflinching kills, and up that blood. That's what was needed for this, for it to be much better. This is from the long film era of painting sex as making you a terrible person, and it's a stigma we're actually kind of just really starting to get over, especially in film. Um, with slashers, obviously, especially the camp-related slashers, it was all about, uh, you know, if you do drugs, if you drink, if you're doing pranks, if you're having sex, especially if you're having sex, especially in this film, uh, you're gonna die because it's a bad thing and, and society can't be having that. Um, we're starting to become more liberated, thankfully so. There's nothing wrong with sex. It's nature, people. We're good. Um, so, I'm, I'm just glad that especially the genre, the horror genre, is starting to get over that that stuff. We can still do slashers, but we don't need to make it that if you have sex, you get killed. Just saying. Anyway, so uh, out of five stars with this film, I think I have to do this the same type of rating as I did with the first one, which is where I give it two ratings. I'll give it the rating of as an actual film in the pantheon of all films, and then as a so good it's bad film where I rate it. So, for uh, overall in the Pantheon of Films, uh, I'm going to give it one and a half stars. Uh, it's not terrible. It's not good. So, yeah. But for the so good it's bad, uh, I'm going to give it a two and a half. Um, I'm between a two and a half and a three, but I think I'm going to go with the two and a half because it just, 
disappointed me too much for what they should have done and where they could have gone. That said, like I've been saying, I still enjoy it. I still think it's fun. Uh, and it's been a while since I've seen the third one. I think I enjoy the third one as well, but I'll find out for sure when I, when I sit down and watch it for the review and you'll find out when I do that review. So anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. I really do appreciate it. Put some comments down there. Let's talk about this movie, the whole franchise of movies, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, but do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button because it means a lot to me. It means a lot to my channel to help things grow. Uh, to you, it's literally like a second. It's painless. It costs you nothing. And it's a great way to show your gratitude. Uh, the other thing is if you're going to hit that notification, or I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you're going to hit that subscribe or you already have, make sure you hit the notification bell because that way you will find out whenever I'm putting up new reviews or whenever I'm doing any live streams because those are good times. But regardless, thanks for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.